inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Was so much in that wonderful text. Let's pray together this morning. Father, it is our prayer this morning that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive uh, the truth of your word. Lord, that we wouldn't just um, grasp it with an intellectual knowledge, but Lord, it would fill our hearts with joy uh, the, uh, that we would greatly rejoice today. For the truth that we find here in your word. We ask this today in Jesus name. Amen. As just a reminder of the introduction. Verses 1 and 2. We're talking uh, about a letter from Peter. To uh, those who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. By the sanctifying work of the Spirit. To obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. What a wonderful, wonderful phrase. We see here it's a letter that is written to the elect. We're going to see as we go on that they are being uh, persecuted. They are, being, uh, they are not having an easy time about it. The government is after them. Many are dying for their faith. But that's not what Peter leads with. And that's because what? He learned something on that Sea of Galilee. You have to keep your eyes on Jesus. And wherever he is, you keep your eyes there. Don't look at the storm. Look at him. And he begins his letter that way. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. And you can see him um, beginning this way. uh, Brother Doug will begin next week. To look at the struggle. But this morning I get the great privilege privilege of pointing our eyes to Jesus. And the hope that we have in him. He says you're chosen his letters written to the elect. According to the eternal work of the triune God. All of that packed into that one introductory verse. And, and as Peter thinks of those things, you see the, tr- the trinity there, the foreknowledge of the Father, the sanctifying work of the Spirit, the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. As he begins to think of these things and the work of the triune God in electing his people, what we see in our verse is that very first word, blessed, right? Now, this is not the blessed that I spent so much time on a few weeks ago. This is a completely different word. That word meant what? It was makarios and it means happy, right? That's not this word. Both are great words. This word is um, really the word where we get eulogy. It means to praise. So praise God. Blessed be God. To, to heap praise on him for what he has done. We see that this book begins with a doxology. He introduces the book and what's going on, but it leads directly to praise, to doxology. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He begins, he cannot help himself. Just like Paul so often will, will, will give this wonderful theological statement. But what? It leads directly to doxology, to praise. R.C. Sproul said this, theology, if it's done correctly, must always end in doxology. If theology, your theology does not lead to doxology, it's cold and dead. Our theology, like we said, we are not the chosen frozen, right? Why? Because we have something to get excited about when we understand all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus. True theology doesn't just stop in your head. It's not something you just spout from your head. You need it in your head. 
but it filters down, it percolates down into our heart and into our lives and it comes back overflowing. That's theology and doxology and we see it exactly here this morning. Blessed uh, is the word for eulogy. We see a Trinitarian doxology too that we also see from Paul throughout the words of Paul. You see it? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see that throughout uh, the New Testament. Paul uses it quite often. I listed several there. 2 Corinthians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Sounds very Similar, doesn't it? 2 Corinthians 11.31, he uses this phrase, God and Father of our Lord Jesus. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. Ephesians 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. What a beautiful Beautiful phrase. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because why? What has He done? Who has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? Born again. It means to produce again. To be born again. Born anew. It means, uh, to use a theological term, regeneration. New life. And the scripture says he has caused that to happen in us, right? In verse 2, we see that we are chosen according to his will. And verse 3, that we are born again according to his will. This word born again is the topic of conversation that we all know very well between Jesus and Nicodemus at night, right? And Jesus would begin the conversation and respond to Nicodemus by going right to the heart of the matter and saying to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, unless there is new life, regeneration, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. We see this as something that God does within us. Later on in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter will revisit this. You have been born again. And and what was the seed, right? To use reproductive terms. Where did this seed come from? It come from God the Father. who We have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. This is one of my favorite texts, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. One of these that point that it, our salvation is 100% God Zero percent us, right? Hundred zero. You want to know what the Reformation was about? Those numbers, right? Because we desperately want it to be ninety, if even even if it's ninety nine point eight percent God and point two percent us. We desperately want it to be something about us, but it's not, and that's not what the Bible teaches. It's one hundred percent. And 0%, right? That's what the whole Reformation was about. A tiny percent. But it's 100%. And I love it because it's so clear in this verse. God, the God who said, light shall shine out of darkness. The one who said, let there be light. And what? There was light. That God is the one who has shown in our hearts. There was darkness. And what did he say? Let there be light. He caused light to shine in us. It's 0% about us and 100% about him. Right? 
He said, let there be light in my dark heart. And there was light. He has caused, uh, he uh, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. God causes new life to begin. We have nothing to do about it, right? Nothing. Isn't it very interesting on this whole debate on 100% and 0%, 98%, 2%, whatever percentages you want to throw in there? It's very interesting that the two primar- uh, primary um, pictures is death and new birth, right? Took those who were dead and made them alive, gave them new birth. Right? What did you have to do with your conception? <laughs> Zero, right? Zero. You weren't there. Those are the two pictures that are used in the scriptures. And the picture that Peter begins with here we are born again. And it, um, look at verse 3. Let's continue going through here. We are born again. To a living hope. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This word hope, just a reminder, we have taken this word and the way we use it is nowhere close to what the biblical word means, right? When you use the word hope every day in your life, how do you use it? Well, you know, you hope your team wins, right? It's wishful thinking, right? This is what I hope happens. This is what I wish would happen. If things go my way, this is the way I want them to go. That's the way we have started to use the word hope. But the word hope in the Bible never read that kind of a definition into it. It is a confident expectation. This is what is going to happen How do you know? Have you seen it? No, I have not seen it. But this is what God says is going to happen. Hope comes from faith. Faith. God said it and we believe it. Right? He produces faith in our hearts. And now we know. I just love it. I love to listen to John MacArthur. And it was an old, old tape from the 80s, I think. And and, uh, him and Phil Donahue were going back and forth. You know, I don't know where Phil Donahue is today, but I know where John MacArthur is, and he's still going strong, right? But uh, Phil Donahue was just saying, oh, I cannot believe that this John MacArthur thinks that he knows. And John was responding to this in one of his sermons. He said, the only problem I have with what Phil said is, I don't think I know. I know! Why does he know? Why do we know? Because God has said it in His word, there are things that we can know. There's a deep-seated knowledge, a confident expectation. This is the way this is going to play out. How do you know? Because God said this is the way it's going to play out, right? That's the word hope, confident expectation, not wishful thinking. And the scripture uses a wonderful adjective here. We have a living hope. You know why our hope is alive? It's directly tied to Jesus' resurrection. Our hope is alive today because Jesus is alive today. That's how we know what's going to happen, right? Because Jesus rose from the dead. Our hope, notice in the scripture, is tied to to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We all know this passage very well, 1 Corinthians 15. And it's this, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? You know, as Paul is going through this, I've highlighted or made them in bold there in your guide, but wonderful, wonderful statements. All of our hope hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. All of it. 
If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is vain. It's worthless. Your faith is vain. It's worthless today. All right? Moreover, we uh, are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, here it is again, your faith is worthless. What are you doing here? Right? You know, there's an argument out there that sometimes people use with non-believers you know, that even if it's not real, you know, I just believe that the teaching of the Bible makes my life better. That is such a wishy-washy, wimpy, non-biblical answer. Why? What's a Paul say? If this isn't real, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what are we doing here? We're wasting our time. That's what Paul says. So don't ever give that answer. I think, you know, the teachings of Jesus, he's just a good teacher. He makes my life better, makes your life better. No. It's worthless. It's all worthless if he is not risen and sitting on his throne today. But if he is, it makes all the difference. Amen? Amen. If Christ has been raised, your faith is uh, not been raised, your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Don't ever use that wimpy argument again. We're born again uh, to a living hope. We're born again to a lasting inheritance. Verse 4, we are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance. Now some of you probably know all about inheritances. How many of you have received an inheritance? Already, right? In our family, in his family tradition, it goes back generations. Mom and dad die, kids split all the bills, right? <laughs> right, that's the inheritance, right? We're, I come from a long line of poor people, right? We are poor folk. Poor folk have poor ways, right? And my parents will pass their debts to me, and I will pass mine to my children, right? That's the way poor folk go, right? <laughs> so I don't know about inheritance. I don't remember ever hearing about it. I don't really know what it would feel like to know that you have an inheritance coming if it weren't for the truth of God's word. Amen. Right? But I was born to Pofo. Right? My dad talks about stories about eating his horses. That's Pofo, right? Living, growing up in West Virginia. There's even shows about my family's my 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 dad's family, right? <laughs> There's some po folk. So I don't physically, earthly know anything about inheritance. So I get just plain excited when I read the truth of God's word. Guess why? Because I I grew up poor, destitute. Bankrupt spiritually. And I don't understand it. And I can't wrap my mind around it because I am destitute and my family is bankrupt. We are rebels against the Holy God. We are cursed by Him. We don't have anything. And yet the scripture says, I'm adopted into a rich family. I have no idea what that means. I can't even wrap my mind completely around it. 
Because I'm used to being poor. I have no idea what it means to be rich. But the Bible says we are adopted into money. Right? We're adopted into wealth that we can't even fathom. Right? Isn't that what it says? We are going to obtain an inheritance from God. That Galatians 1 is really a great uh, discussion about the purpose of the law and how the law kind of treated us like children. Even though we, we were very wealthy children, got us ready, but I love the last part where it points toward adoption. That we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. You are no longer cursed. You are no longer destitute. You are no longer po folk. You are a son, and if you are a son, you are an heir of God. That's beautiful. I love John 1, 12 and 13. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And talking about it being God's will earlier that we would be born again, that we would be adopted into his family. Look at the verse 13. We believe in his name who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. It's His will that we be adopted into His family. And we can't even fathom what that means. Because we are all spiritually poor folk, destitute, bankrupt. We ain't got nothing. And we didn't get nothing from our parents. They didn't get anything from their parents. We rebelled against the Holy God and we got nothing. And now we got everything. That's hard to wrap your mind around. You know, we have adopted some children, one of them internationally. And one of them, we had to go there, and it's very interesting. The way we did this adoption is just so much lines up with what Christ has done for us, right? We had to make two trips. Guess what? Jesus is making two trips. We had to go make one trip in the last two, three weeks. We had to meet. We would meet with her every day. And man, she was nine months old. And it was just heartbreaking, the conditions of that uh, Russian orphanage. And, and they didn't have people to rock them to sleep. Guess what? She had these adaptive behaviors that she would beat her head against her wooden uh, um, spindle crib just to go to sleep it was self-soothing behavior and the spindles you can ask jessica on her crib olga's crib the spindles themselves were broken from that poor child having to try to comfort herself to go to sleep every night beating her head until she would just pass out and we had to see that and then we had to leave and it was like, how many months? Four months? Four months later, we came back. But this time, we came back to take her home. And we could, and she was 13 months at that time, and we could tell her all day. And we were poor. We were poor. But what we had was so much more than anything she could understand. We could tell her all day what our house looked like, and then she had this huge yard to play in, and then she would be sharing her room with her sister, and we made, we'd put a castle wallpaper up just for her, and she had her own crib, and she had these siblings, and the, uh, you know all of this stuff, and it would make no sense because all she knew was that orphanage. All she knew was her misery. She could not fathom what it was that was waiting for her in this wonderful place called Texas. <laughs> We're the same. 
We, we try and try to communicate it. But no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. He made the first trip already and prepared everything. Dear friends, He's coming again and taking us home. Amen. That's good news. Verse 4, continuing on, we attain an inheritance which is imperishable. Listen, all of these adjectives, I didn't even take time to spell them out. That's a whole other sermon. But it's imperishable. It will not perish. It will never go away. It's undefiled. It is unstained. It is unsullied. It is unfading. It will never change. It is reserved for you. Only you. Us. What's our confidence this morning? Our confidence is this. That all of this depends on God and none of it depends on us. <laughs> it's what he has reserved for us. We are, listen, protected. His children are protected by the power of God. That's beautiful. That's good news. That's wonderful news. We are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Like small children, we are called to trust in the protection of our Heavenly Father. I love this. Our confidence lies in His power to hold us, not our abilities to hold on to Him. Amen. You ever seen a small child walking with their parent? There is a vast difference between the child holding on to the parent's hand and the parent holding on to the child's hand. Right? That child is doing all the holding, parents not paying attention. That child stumbles and will fall every time because they are not very strong. That parent holding the child is a completely different thing. That parent's paying attention and holding onto that child's hand. If that child stumbles and fall, guess what? Mom, dad, hold them up. There's a there's a big difference. We gotta uh, be very careful. There is a big difference between a, a, even a small faith in a big God and a large faith in a false God. Right? Or a large faith in faith. Faith is only as good as the object in which it's placed. Now what would God prefer? That we have had great faith in a great God. But I'm telling you that small faith in a great God is much better than large faith in a false God. We are, remain confident today because He holds us. Because we, His children, those that He chose to adopt into His family are Protected by the power of God. That provides wonderful confidence for us. I was a skittish, scared little kid. I was just one of those little nervous, firstborn Nellies, you know. We can't break the rules. Mom, Dad didn't say we could do that. I was a timid little kid. But I remember... And I probably have used this illustration before. My dad was a general contractor. He built big things. And he was the boss. Everybody on that job site, he signed their checks. Right? And you know, job sites are usually not friendly places for small children. For good reason. Right? You know, you can, the children can die out there. But so carpenters and plumbers, electricians, all these people, you know, they see little kids messing around job site. They're going to yell at them, tell them to get out of there, right? Every time. 
I mean, being a little skittish kid, I remember getting yelled at by some plumber or electrician or framers or whoever it was. They didn't know me, but I'm messing around the job site, and they tell you, hey, kid, get out of here. I was like, my dad is Dave. And he'd say, okay, kid, sorry. Do whatever you want. You want to play with my nail gun? <laughs> right? It's like, sorry, man. Dave's the boss. That's his kid. He can do whatever he wants. There was a confidence in this timid little child that would come out because I knew my dad is the boss. Dear friends, there should be a confidence in us. It's not a self-confidence. It's not a conky, cocky confidence. It's not a I'm better than you confidence. But there is a confidence that is deep in us because our dad is the boss. Right? He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. There is, should be a confidence. We hear that in Scripture. I love these texts. Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? I wish I could go back and go over them. If God is for us, who can be against us? You hear the confidence? It's not a prideful confidence. It's not arrogance. It's not... Um, Cocky, it's not I'm looking down my nose at you. It's none of that. But it is a confidence that God is protecting us because we are his children. We need that confidence. We need that confidence today. The second a scientist tells you that they are evolutionist, most of us are like, oh, he's a Ph.D., well, now I work in that field. I know what that stands for. Right? I won't say it. <laughs> but if you begin by rejecting God and you're extremely brilliant, it just means that you will go farther and farther away from the truth and become more and more and more of a fool. That's what the Bible says. And, and why should we be intimidated by the blind leading the blind into the ditch? We should not be. Why? Because we know the truth. And we can see. If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will we not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? No one. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Hear the confidence? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather he who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Jesus intercedes for us. Why am I afraid? There's no good reason. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation? No, not a chance. That's the Cowboys playing Wascom next Friday night. Right? Well, persecution, not a chance. Persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We are protected by his power. Come hell or high water, whatever it is, we are protected. That's what the Bible says. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Dear friends, really all we do need to know is this, that He demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. There is such confidence here. We are protected, verse 5, 
by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This word salvation is awesome, right? Because there is salvation past, there is salvation present. We, are, we have been saved through faith. This is not from ourselves, it's the gift of God. We have been saved. We are being saved. And we will be saved in the future. We will be saved. Our salvation is ready to be revealed. It is prepared for us. Verses, Matthew chapter 25. You know this text well. Verses 31 through 34. Talking about the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in His glory. And all the angels with Him. Then He will sit on His glorious throne. And all the nations, all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, his people, those his children that he adopted into his family. The first ones he speaks to is his kids, right? His children, the sheep. And what does he say? Come, you who are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom, what? Prepared for you. It's prepared for you from the foundation of the world. John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus would say this to his disciples. Do not let your heart be troubled. We need to hear that today. Don't, don't do it. I watch the news and think about the way things are going and I become troubled. I get irritated. <laughs> I get upset. Sometimes I feel helpless. What can we really do about it? Don't, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Also believe in Christ. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Amen. He will come again and receive you to myself that where I am you may be also, dear friends, he's made two trips for our adoption as well. He's already made the first, but he's coming again to take us home. Rejoice. Verse 5, we are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. On that last day, in the final trumpet the day of the Lord. I love this 1 John 2, uh, verse 3, verses 1 through 3. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. It's all right here that we should be called the children of God. The greatest thing that could be said of us we are children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us. And Doug will be talking all about that next week. Why? Because the church is under persecution. The world does not know us. Because it did not know Him. Beloved, now, because of His great mercy, we are children of God. Protected by Him. 
adopted into his family. And it has not yet appeared as what we shall be. The world has no idea what's going to hit them. I often say, we're all going to be surprised. We have our, even our Christian heroes, right? That we put up on a pedestal. And I think there's going to be people like my mom that never say a word to anyone, but have served others and Christ silently, quietly, in the background. Always putting others first. And what did Jesus say about that person? They are great in the kingdom of God. And we even today as Christians don't notice them. But Christ does. And it's not yet appeared to us what my mom's going to be in heaven. Because she truly has put everyone in front of herself. My mom will be great. Because Jesus said she would be. Because she has been a servant of all. Most of her adult life. Since she came to Christ. Quietly serving others. Placing them before herself. And one day we're going to be surprised. We're going to think. Oh I thought that was going to be Billy Graham's. But who is Kathy Sullins? Right? <laughs> well, I think I want to know this person. Right? She's going to be great. Wow, we don't know what's going to happen. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. Everyone who has this hope. Remember, we're not wishful thinking. It's fixed on him. How do we survive persecution? Like I said, Peter learned the lesson. You don't look at the storm. You look at Jesus. Don't take your eyes off of him. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you will be drawn to him. You will move toward him. And you'll be just fine. You will survive the storm. Guaranteed. Last night, I was almost moved to tears, and I tried to hide it from everyone, even my family. We went to the Natchitoches Christmas Parade, and I hope I'm not going late. I've got two minutes. Great story, two minutes. And magnificent fireworks display. I don't know if you've ever been to the Natchitoches Christmas lights, anyone? All day... This is probably not recommended in scripture, but gluttony. Cajun, Cajun gluttony. <laughs> right? Like 15 trips and $5,000 later for boudin balls and meat pies and gumbo and etouffee and all day long laying around on a tarp. This is Cajun paradise. And then as it gets close to dark, there's going to be this fireworks display and all of those of us that were prepared, we got there early in the morning and we put our tarps down. But then here comes all the Johnny-come-latelys right at uh, dark and they all stand around and they're trying to get on your tarp and you're trying to be Christian about it. <laughs> no, actually, we were very generous. We're like, you can have our corner. You can sit on the corner of our tarp. But there's such an anticipation. There's these thousands of people gathered on this, this, this riverfront. And everyone is waiting. And then it begins. And man, it was, it, it was better than anything I've seen at Disney World. For a fireworks display. And what I loved about this year is the first song they played was Joy to the World. And the music kicks up, and like one firework, it started slow, and then that first burst where it was, <laughs> and I was listening to the words of the song when it said this, joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. And I, I could just thought that song is about his first coming. 
But those words are about his second coming. And I thought ahead to that anticipation when we are all home in victory, overwhelmingly conquering through Christ who loved us. And he is seated on his throne. And we all, I just said, I was imagining fireworks. Why? Because we do that when we win. And the fireworks are going off and the scripture and then the song is saying, let earth receive her king. And the fireworks are going off like crazy. What a day that will be. when We all get to heaven. What a wonderful day that will be. I'm ready. And the scripture says all of this. I skipped the verse. Anybody notice that I skipped a, a part of the verse? I know Jason did. Anyone else notice that I skipped part of a verse this morning? Y'all need to be on the card about that. You need to be like, why did he skip a verse? Don't skip verses. I skipped it on purpose. All of this that is prepared for us. We are adopted into his family. We went from being having nothing to having everything. We have hope in heaven. There's going to be more than we can imagine. All of this, the part I skipped is this, is according to His great mercy. Amen. It's all because of Him and His mercy toward us. He gets all the glory. It's all according to His great mercy that we have this. And to lead into our verse next week, Peter says, in this, we greatly rejoice. That's how we face the persecution. That's how we face the difficulty. That's how we face everything. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. In this, we greatly rejoice. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we cannot express our gratitude today for the living hope we have in Christ. And even as we just meagerly attempt to imagine all that you have stored and prepared for us, our hearts are filled with joy, with love, and with gratitude. Lord, please receive our praise today. In Jesus' name, amen.